Good evening, everyone. I am your host and instructor, Lainey Shaughnessy, and welcome to Spindle TV, your best source for CNC CAD CAM training videos. Spindle TV is brought to you by Digital Woodcarver, inspiring your creativity and providing you with the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Glad to be back. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm starting a little bit early tonight. Uh, I'm going to give a chance for everybody to get in, but hopefully everything goes well. Mm -hmm. How you doing, Mike, Kevin, and William, and David? Hey, Tippy and Dave. No shave November. Yes, I'll be I'll be shaving next week. <laughs> uh. Is that uh, I thought I thought it was Movember where you actually grew it out, Dave. <laughs> or is it no? Sh are you asking no shave November, like where you don't shave for the whole month of November? <laughs> this has been this has been a little bit more than the month of November. How's it going, Mr. Tippy Looter? If you can still hear me, uh, I have not uh, forgotten those files for you. I will send them over. Hey, Roger. How you doing? Oh, tonight we're going to, uh, we're going to do an open Q and a because, um, you know, there's a lot of changes happening with the Vetric software, you know, V10 came out. We talked a little bit about it, uh, the week before and, um, uh, the, the, the other week, the last week I did a, a show, and we talked about some of the um, new features and things. There's a, there's a lot, there was a lot to go over and uh, sorry, my reflection is coming back in my glasses, but um, the, Oh, did I tip it? Good. I'm glad I sent those files, but there's a lot of uh, changes in that. But just in general, I want to go over some Q and a, and I want to talk about planet CNC uh, TNG uh, the next generation. Uh, for those users uh, that are uh, Vetric users using uh, Planet CNC, um, TNG, Vetric, or Planet CNC has come out with a new version, V2, Planet CNC TNG V2. And I'm going to ask that all digital woodcarver users not download V2 just yet. Wait till you hear from me. Uh, because the new algorithms and things in V2, uh, some of our settings are not compatible with it. We've got to make some code changes and stuff. So hold off on downloading the V2 beta version, beta version, uh, until you hear from me uh, in the Digital Wave Carver owners group or on a, another live stream or something. So uh, hang up on that. Hey, John. And... Uh, Tissue, 1984. Give me a first name so I don't call you Tissue through the whole video. <laughs> um, but uh, don't don't download the uh, TNG beta version yet, the new V2, V2 beta version yet, because uh, you'll get some wonky things going on with the machine and stuff because the new scripts and, and, and all that stuff, uh, I've got to go through and, and make some changes in the settings and everything. Uh, to make it compatible with the new version too. So I will be releasing those files on the digitalwoodcarver.com website, and then I'll be able to release an announcement that uh, it's V2 is good to go. But it just came out. Uh, this is Planet CNC TNG again that we're talking about for anybody that just popped in. Um, 
It just came out a week or so ago. Hold off on downloading it until we can get caught up on our end and get the um, get the uh, setting files and everything adapted to the new version. And we can, I can create a new set of setting files for the new version. Tom Shoemaker, I should have guessed it, Tom. I don't know why it didn't click in, but uh, I should have guessed it, Tissue. But uh, I should have guessed it. Um. <clears throat> All right, so people are popping in. Wonderful, good to go, good to go. Uh, let me share the uh, screen, uh, my screen and everything, and show you kind of um, the projects that we're gonna be talking about and stuff uh, while we're doing a Q&A and answering questions and everything. Uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna kind of go, not old school, but we're gonna kind of go back to, uh, you know, um, doing some uh, simple things and, and stuff in the controller software, as you can see here, let's kind of make that bigger. Uh, I'm going to keep my screen up for a little bit because uh, we're, I'll make the screen bigger when we're actually, when I'm when answer, answering some questions, but um, um, you know, we have a, a lot of new users and old users alike and, you know, old users and everything, uh, you know, simple sign making, you know, it's, you're probably past that, but now, and you're, you're into doing much more creative things, but I wanted to just kind of touch on some of my favorite tools and stuff, uh, like the, um, uh, texturing tool path, uh, generator and, uh, some other things. And then I want to talk about, you know, taking multiple items like this, text of uh, welcome to our home and then uh, this vine and kind of integrating them into one another to create kind of a unique look and stuff and having some fun with it and stuff. Um, and we're going to, we're going to uh, end up making something uh, from scratch. It may not look like this, you know, but uh, um, we'll come up with something a little different as well. All right. Fell. Yeah, I fell. <laughs> I fell on that one, Tom. Um, hey, Rochelle, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Rochelle. I'm glad to see you again after this weekend. Uh, awesome. And um, uh, the user group meeting files uh, will be sent out to all the people that came to. We had a digital woodcarver owners group meeting in um, Dayton, Ohio this past weekend. And uh, we had quite a few people out doing some uh, kind of one on one. Uh, in-depth training or just, you know, training and, and, and stuff on the machines and everything. And uh, I've got some files to send out to y'all. So I'll be sure to get those out to you, Rochelle, and anyone else from that group. All right. Now, um, for those of you that might be watching me from Canada, uh, I'll be up in Hamilton, Canada tomorrow uh, for the uh, Hamilton Woodworking Show, the Canadian Woodworking Shows. Um, I'll be up there this weekend at the Hamilton Woodworking Show. So definitely, uh, if you're out in that area, stop by and uh, look forward to seeing you. Yes, yes. David Gatton, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time we're in Atlanta. Hopefully we do Atlanta uh, and everything uh, for the woodworking shows. We'll see you there. All right. So you guys and girls can fire away uh, with your questions. Uh, this is an open Q&A. Uh, you can, uh, you can, um, you can ask anything you want and, uh, we'll go through the answers and stuff. Uh, Trina, can we get the files as well? Uh, Trina, are you talking about, uh, the files like this home sweet home or the files I was referring to from our digital woodcarver owners group meeting? Cause the, those files were kind of, uh, based around the digital wood carver units, uh, 2440, the PowerPoint presentation and stuff like that. Um, but uh, uh, those, for those that, the, the, those files, I mean, some of the files and stuff I could make available for download, but they would be a purchase item because the people that attended the group um, uh, had to pay to attend. So they paid for these files and stuff. So it would be some kind of, you know, paid digital download, but not all the files are relatable to uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of maintenance things and, and, and different things for the 2440s and the mini carpers and stuff. But yes, uh, I'll see what, I'll see what project files we have, uh, that are, 
might be of interest and they, they could be available for a paid digital download. Unfortunately, I would not be able to give them away uh, and stuff. All right, so guys and girls, fire away, ask your questions and we'll get into it. And while we're doing that, I'll keep an eye out on the uh, chat area for those questions. And as we're doing that, uh, we'll go through and actually kind of create a project. You know, at the same time, a civil sign project and things. And now you're going to see me as I'm creating the sign project. And these questions could be, um, will be, uh, those questions will be, uh, I'll be switching back and forth, but they could be fee card, desktop and pro or Aspire question. I'll be happy to answer. William Wallace, the wasteboard files are already available. The 2440 wasteboard files are available on the video in Spindle TV that's, uh, it was a couple weeks back, a versatile wasteboard. If you click onto that video, in the description of that video is the download file for the wasteboards, uh, for the wasteboard files. And um, they could be, if you don't have a 2440 or, or something, it could be modified for your machine. And uh, if you have a mini carver, um, those files, uh, I can also make available as well. So yes, as far as the wasteboard files go. And uh, William, you were at the user group meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, I can, when I when I send your email, William Wallace, you were at the group. That name sounds familiar. Yes. Um, when I send those files out, I can send the wasteboard files too. Hey, Jeff, how you doing, bud? All right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and let's get started in a fresh new way here. Um, I'm going to delete this because I, I ended up not liking it and stuff. <clears throat> All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to export this out in my Vetric software as a DXF because I want to I want to keep that. So I'm actually going to export it out to my C drive. Users public public documents, Vetric files folder. And in my clip art, I have a custom folder here and I'm just gonna paste this and I'm just gonna call this a uh, welcome sign one, cause I know it'll not be the first one I ever make. And I'm gonna click save. And what that'll do is that will put it into my uh, custom folder in my clip art. Um, which you won't see it until I restart the software, but it'll drop it in there so I can use it for a future project. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, let's go back to the beginning of our software while we're asking for, uh, waiting for some questions. Pop up. And guys, just fire away uh, with any questions you got them. This is what this is all about, open Q&A. Um, I'm going to make a single-sided sign here. Actually, I'm going to make a two-sided sign. I want to put a keyhole toolpath on the back side. So for those of you that are kind of new and not know how to make a keyhole toolpath with using the gadget and without using the keyhole gadget, if you have desktop, you know, that's a V-card desktop or something, you'll get to see that uh, uh, in, in this project and stuff. So I'll do a double-sided sign. Uh, the sign is going to be 20 by 12, which uh, I wish I had my tape measure. That should be a pretty decent size welcome sign. Uh, it's going to be three quarters of an inch thick and I will be referencing off of my waste board for this sign. So I'm going to use the machine bed as the option and I'm going to be starting from the bottom left corner of my board uh, and uh, we'll go with a flip direction along the Y axis. I'm kind of a creature of habit. So I like flipping along the Y versus flipping along my X axis. So I'm going to stick with that. All right, let's get it. Let's get into a bigger screen here. Okay. And uh, good evening from Columbus, Ohio. We were just there. Absolutely. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to be flipping my, uh, this two sided project along my Y axis. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, on this job setup, I'm going to click OK. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new layer. I'll turn that layer off in case somebody wants to refer back to that for whatever reason. Uh, this layer, I'm going to rename it and I'm just going to call this uh, uh, 
Spindle TV glass. Probably won't be the only layer I make, but there it is. All right, let's make sure that that layer is active. I should be able to read it up here, and when I look at it, it should be highlighted. So um, while we're uh, getting started and, and questions are going to start popping in here, you're going to see me switch back and forth, so I will be pausing from the uh, training to answer those questions. So we're going to kind of jump around a little bit tonight, but not too bad, not too bad. Um, I'm going to start off with a border, the full size of my project here. And um, I'm going to click apply. And now let's go ahead and answer this question uh, from Kevin. Does Aspire 10 overwrite old version or is it a new install? It is a new install. Uh, most all of Vetrix major updates are a new install and not an overwriting install. Uh, so you're actually still going to have your nine or 9.5 uh, icon and everything on in, in files and stuff on your computer. And then you're going to have a new desktop icon and, and file folders and stuff for the Aspire 10 or VCarve 10. If you have any of the 10 version, it does not overwrite. It is a new install. Okay. Baron. Now Baron jumps in with overwrites. Um, Baron, if I, uh, come in here and look at my software and on, I go to my desktops, if I show my desktop icons, let me go to my display settings here. That's actually not the correct window. <laughs> uh, where is my show? Hold on now. There it is. Show desktop icon. I knew I knew it was going to be in there. If we um, show the Okay. Woo, look at that. That's why I hide my icons. Look at that mess. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Uh, you will see here uh, that uh, 9, 9.5, uh, 10 and everything. So, you know, it um, 10 is hiding over somewhere. But let me hide those icons again. That's <laughs> that is a mess, Laney. What in the world? Oh my goodness. Uh, but Baron is thinking about the updates, the minor updates that happen all the time. Those do overwrite. Basically, they are, they're, they're a patch. So they're, they're, they're kind of an inclusive update. They're repairs and things like that. So they go in and repair your existing software. But new, the major versions and stuff like 9, 9.5, and 10, those are updates. Great question. Uh, and thank you, Baron, for jumping in on that. All right, let's get back to our Vetrix software. What a mess that was. Holy camoly. All right, now I've, I created this border here, and I want to offset it inward. And I'm going to offset it inward uh, uh, three quarters of an inch. Now, I want it to create sharp corners, and I want to delete the original one. I don't need the outside border. And I want to select the new. So I'm going to bring that in. And... Um, I'm going to go ahead and close that tool. And now I'm going to go back to my rectangle tool. Now, imagine if I go back to my rectangle tool, you know, I can edit this selected rectangle. But let's say that I accidentally deselected the rectangle and I open up my tool and I want to try to edit this. If I start clicking, I'm just going to end up creating rectangles everywhere. So what you want to do is you need to hold your shift key down to select an existing object, hold your shift key down to select an existing object for editing. And I want to give this an internal radius of three quarters of an inch. So I'm going to change that to an internal radius of three quarters and click apply. It's going to give me, I like the little decorative corners and things and stuff. Uh, so um, uh, hopefully those will be nice. All right. So I'm still here checking on you guys. 
All right. Keep an eye out. Keep those questions coming. Uh, keep posting them. Hopefully my broadcaster is keeping up. Uh, let me know if there's any audio issues or video issues. Uh, and um, I will uh, uh, go from there. Um, so the screen is probably blurry because I um, this is a new broadcaster, so I'm not quite sure, but it might be if I changed my display settings and lowered the number a bit, they might come in a little bit clearer. Um, but uh, is anyone else finding the screen blurry? Uh, I mean, I can see a little bit of blur there even with my glasses on and stuff, but I can always go in and um, change my display settings and make my screen a little bit bigger let me see if I can do that for you guys and girls. Uh, display settings. I'm running, uh, I'm rocking 1920 by 1080. Let me see if I can come down to 128720. Ooh, everything bigger there. Uh, and let's go back into that Vetric. How's that? Is that better? Is that better for you? <clears throat> Let me know if that's better. Should be. It's much bigger. My icons are huge now. <laughs> and it's all good. Looks okay to me. All right. Ronnie, let me know if that's better for you, bud. The icons and everything should be much bigger and much clearer now. Okay. All right. So um, keep those questions coming. Uh, get them rolling in. I'm just going to keep moving along as we do. All right. So I've got my border. Now, I, I want to think outside the box with using the distort uh, for the text, uh, the distort tool, which is a, a, a lovely tool that never gets used as much as it should. It's got a lot of cool things to do. Um, but, uh, the, um, I want to use that and then we're going to take and we're going to find some, uh, other images or, or details to, uh, come in with it, uh, to blend in with it and see if we can make something decorative and creative on the fly here. All right. All right, Ronnie, I, hopefully, but, uh, it gets a little bit better, uh, uh, right now, that's as big as I can make it because my my uh, my screen is huge right now. Uh, so um, uh, so that's about as I could the best the best quality I could get it uh, where where we're at. So hopefully it works for you. All right, let's see here. So um, you saw the welcome sign that we created, but I want to kind of uh, I want to use that theme of welcome uh to do uh, a couple of uh, uh different uh takes on on a design and stuff in these designs we could probably do cut cutouts of them uh or we could uh, do kind of the raised text uh like i'm doing uh for this first one i'm gonna type in uh welcome in capital letters and uh i'm gonna go with a nice um big bold font go and uh, I want to go with a text height of three oop, not three uh, I'm gonna go in a different tool that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna close this out I'm gonna go into my draw text within a vector box tool I want to use this tool that way I can I've got my bounding box that I can um, work with and I want this text to be um, fit within a 16 by 16 by 8 uh, I need room for my upper and lower elements let's go 16 by 5 there we go. And normal margins in there. And let's type that welcome sign in once again. 
And let's go back to our Rockwell Bold. Extra bold. And I, I'm going to stretch the characters. Um, let's go stretch the characters vertically like that. Kind of get that big old welcome sign going on there. And um, let's go ahead and my spacing looks good. I'm going to touch up my spacing a bit. So I'm going to use the edit text spacing and curve tool. And keep those questions coming. I don't see any questions popping up yet, but that's what this is, a live q and I'm just doing the filler of a uh, project so you guys and girls uh, aren't sitting there listening and we're just having a staring contest. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hold my shift key. Let's see here. I need to I'm gonna push this apart a little bit. Give myself a little bit of space um, here. That looks good. Let's see. Okay. So we got some space there, and I'm going to go ahead and center that up left to right. All right. So <clears throat> What can we do to give this, to blend in something, a nice little decorative element and stuff? And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw two rectangles. But before we draw those two rectangles, we're going to answer a, another quick question. So when you download the new version of VCar Pro, is there anything that we might lose uh, in the new tool list um, is there? So... Uh, lose uh, the new tool list is there. So is there anything you might lose uh, when downloading the new version? No, but what you need to make sure of is at the end of, uh, you know, the install, it'll ask you if you want to merge your post processors, your tool database files and things from your earlier version over to the new. And you want to make sure that you do do that. You want to make sure that you merge those uh, files over and you shouldn't lose anything. There should not be anything to lose when you're moving from one version to another um, on your updates and things. Okay. Great question, Jeff. Hopefully that answered it. Um, <clears throat> so this is exactly what I'm going to be doing uh, in this project. Uh, Baron Lynn asked that, uh, you know, he was watching today on how to add textures to the backdrop of a sign. And he's asking to show steps. So Baron, you're in luck because I'm actually going to be adding a texture to the backdrop of this sign uh, that will uh, basically uh, give us a look such as, we'll let this, not that one. Hold on. Stop. Never mind. Not that one. Hold on a second there, Baron. One, two, three, preview visible tool pass. So while we're talking, we'll <clears throat> let that carve out and stuff. And um, you'll get to, you, we're gonna be adding textures to this new sign. All right, so let's take away that. So Baron, you're in luck, we're gonna get to see that. Um, David Kinsey, uh, David, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, with the audio and stuff, um, hopefully it gets fixed for you. <clears throat> so this uh, home, uh, welcome to our home sign, has a nice, one of my favorite textures is using a eighth inch tapered ball nose bit to create kind of this uh, decorative texture. Um, and my texture is going at a slight nine degree angle. We're gonna be talking about the texture tool pass. Um, here in just a moment. And William Wallace, let's see here. William Wallace, uh, use the offset how much? So uh, use offset how much? So on that, William, uh, I did an eighth inch offset from my border and my text because my raised text was an eighth inch tall. 
And based on that and the angle of the text, because it gets wider as it goes down, uh, I stepped away an eighth of an inch uh, to give clearance around my letters so my bit doesn't run into my letters and things. As you can see around here, you know, it, it uh, gives me a little bit of a cushion, if you will, you know. So uh, there's that. Now, another good question uh, from Jeff is, uh, Will we be able to load the new program to more computer uh, just like we got when we bought our first VCARB? Yeah, you can install the VCARB, your update, VCARB 10 and all. You can put it on up to three computers just like just like normal. None, none of that changes. None of that changes. So hopefully that uh, answers your question, Jeff. But yes, you can put it on up to three com consecutively running computers. Oh, excellent. Uh, uh, David, um, congratulations on getting your 2440 and uh, get with me if you got it last week, then most likely you and I have not done your orientation training, your two hour orientation training. Email me at sales at digitalwoodcarver.com to schedule that training uh, sometime so we can get you rocking and rolling and stuff. So awesome on you. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do here is uh, I'm gonna draw two rectangles. And I'm actually going to draw one and then copy it. <laughs> All right, on this rectangle here, uh, let's make it a little bit, little bit wider, not much. And then I want to make sure that on it uh, that it, I get a little bit of overlap. Now I'm going to get a lot of overlap on the C because it humps up, but that's fine. But a little bit of overlap. There we go. And uh, I'm going to take and go into my mirror tool over here. And I'm going to create a mirrored copy, flipping it about job center, and I'm gonna flip it vertically and put another bar down there. Nice, right? So far, so good. Um, and uh, before I start blending all this stuff together and things like that, uh, I want to add some other decorative elements. Now, for those uh, decorative elements, um, I I like flourishes uh, or or swirls or uh, different type of things, um, and so. I will go online and I'll look and see what uh, type of flourishes are out there. And let me pull this tab over so you can kind of see. Um, I'll pull over and see what kind of flourishes are out there. And then, of course, um, you know, I want to find a uh, flourish that is going to complement my project or kind of work with my project in, in, in things uh, that, that is going to give me a nice uh, decorative element and everything. So uh, when we are searching, uh, I'm a Google searcher and I love using the Google tools. Uh, and in the Google tools, I can use the Google tools to filter out the searches to only show me large images. These are going to be highly pixeled images and things. And they're going to give me the best uh, trace quality and things like that when we're tracing images and stuff. And um, I am uh, liking that one with the heart there and stuff. Now, when you see me use images uh, on the computer and stuff um, and, and everything, um, you know, a lot of people worry about copyrights and things like that. Uh, you want to do the right thing and, and, and uh, go to vector stock and uh, purchase those and all that. Uh, when I'm using them in an in instructing capacity, uh, I'm using them under the Fair Trade Act, which uh, it basically I can use to teach with and stuff. But uh, if you're if you've got some uh, concerns, you can look up free vectors, uh, flourishes. You can use the keyword free or you can go to uh, freevectors.com. There's a lot of uh, different decorative ones in there, but uh, I've had that question uh, come up a couple of times and um, I wanted to answer that. 
All right. So let's see. Uh, kind of like this design. So I'm going to save this image. And the images are subject to copyright, the digital images. When we trace them, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, it becomes an artist rendering. But still, be a stand-up guy or girl and go to there and sign up for an account and, and get the vectors a good way like that. All right. All right. Now, I'm going to import. Let's go. I'm going to create a new layer. Actually, I don't have to create a new layer. Software is going to do it for me. I'm going to import that image. And let's go up to my uh, quick access uh, recent. Okay. And now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to turn off my main layer. Uh, and uh, that's going to leave my bitmap layer, this image layer open. And I'm going to create, I'm going to add a new layer and I'm going to call this uh, image trace. And I want to make sure, and Lord of mercy, hit the enter button when you do that. Image trace, enter, there we go. Make sure that that is active, and uh, there we go. All right, so uh, when tracing an image, don't size the image. Even though in V10, you know, I can now rotate images and everything, which we couldn't do before. We have the freedom to rotate bitmaps. And where that's useful, why would you want to rotate the bitmap is because, you know, if it was an image that I needed to be a little bit of rotation I could size it and kind of kind of get a look at it with my project to see if it's the image that I want to use and all that stuff and it might have to it might require it to be turned a little bit you know when I'm when I'm sizing it and everything uh, so I like that option now we weren't able to do that before so let me get back to where we were here um, and we're gonna take a pause for a cool question All right, the question is uh, from Tom Shoemaker. Can you please touch on the bitmap option and the easiest way to use it? That's exactly what we're about to do. If you're referring to the bitmap tracing, that's exactly what we are about to do, Tom. Let me know if that's what you're referring to, and if not, then I'll go into what you're what you're wanting. All right, let's uh, let's hide this box. We don't need to be see stop sharing there. All right, so I zoomed into this. And I'm going to go into the bitmap tracing option. Now, there's two ways to trace a bitmap, color or black and white. Now, if I choose the color option, it's going to look at the image uh, over here. And it's going to lay out 16 of the different shades of colors that it finds in the image. Now, your image will fade just like it is here. If we go down to the very bottom and turn that bitmap fading off to none, we'll be able to see the image in its full color and glory, right? So if we come back up here, all the different shades of colors have been lit, lit up for me. Now I can slide this threshold down and reduce those shades. And as I do, it's taking that image and converting it more and more and more to a black and white image. If I bring it down to virtually three colors, my three main colors are going to be blue, black, and white, right? If I come down to two colors, kind of like black and white, right? So you can play around with the color thresholds, but what your goal is when you're color tracing is you want to check off the colors and you want to check off all the shades of colors uh, until you get a nice solid fill of your trace color, okay? So if I zoom in, you can see all these light shades here. And as I check off these boxes and stuff, you will see these shades start to fill in more and more and things and stuff, right? So what the goal is is to get a nice solid fill of a trace color and everything in there, okay? All righty. All right, so with that nice solid fill trace, um, what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and now scroll down and I'm going to turn up the noise level a little bit. This is going to filter out any noise, any pixelation that we might see in our image. 
it's going to filter that out and not trace, you know, kind of ignore it during the tracing process. So if I click preview, uh, it will go through and trace the image. I'm going to turn that bitmap fading to none so you can see the tracing that was created. Okay. Now, let's say that I undo that tracing. And let's say that I come up here to the bitmap and I choose the black and white option. Well, what that's going to do is immediately it's going to convert the image to a black and white no shades of gray um, in there. And all I have to do, what my goal in life is with the black and white tool is to take my slide bar here and slide it in one direction or the other until I get a nice looking solid fill of a black and white image. And, you know, I want to kind of, you know, kind of build it up until I get a nice fill, not too noisy. You see some noise starting to come in. So I'm going to back down to about 68% here. It's going to be a good for me. And then I'm going to come down and I'm going to click preview to trace out that image. Now, when you do that, don't do what I just did. Don't have the wrong layer selected. That's why everything popped up is when I did an undo, I undid to fall. So my image trace layer got deleted and that tracing had nowhere to go. So when you're undoing, make sure you don't step back too far. So let's get that back where we were and let's go ahead and select our image. With everything um, so big on my screen, if you hear me pausing or something, um, <clears throat> it's because it takes me a minute to see where it's at because it's really big on my screen. It looks good actually in the in the um, in the preview that I'm looking at, but it's really big on my screen. All right, so I'm going to go down and turn that bitmap fading off, like we discussed. And I'm, I should still be at my 68% up here. I am 0.68, should I say. And so I'm going to come down at the very bottom and I'm going to click preview to get that tracing. Okay. Now you have corner fit, noise filter, and default fade or fading, basically bitmap fading. This just fades the image in and out. So we can kind of review our tracing and stuff. Noise filter will filter out a lot of the pixelation and noise and everything to uh, kind of uh, ignore it, if you will. And default is two pixels. Uh, I usually kind of run around, you know, six or seven, but there's no right or wrong, you know. And, um, you know, we can go from there. Uh, the corner fit on these inside and outside corners, do we want a tight fit or a loose fit? Now, if we were to look at my contours and things, my lines and stuff, you know, the software did its best to trace the image and kind of create a nice curve and all. If I were tight, if I undid one time, one time, and I were tight on my image, and I pulled that up to tight, and I preview that, you see how rigid the lines are? So I only time I really go tight is when I'm block doing like tracing of block letters or something in someone's logo and all, uh, because I don't want this rigid, these rigid lines at all. The default corner fit is a nice contour tracing, highly recommended, but of course you can play around with it as needed. You know, if I was too loose, if I undid that tight tracing, And if I were too loose and previewed this, I'm going to get, you know, fairly not too bad on this image. It's going to kind of, you know, give me almost a similar look as to what I had before. So there's really no variation on the loose on this one. But I'm going to undo that. 
and I'm going to go with my default corner fit. Let me select that image. Everything is so huge on my screen. Uh, let me select that image and I'm going to go with the default corner fit and I'm going to go with that there. All right. I'm happy with that. So I'm going to click apply and close. So basically, um, Tom, it, you know, in your bitmap tools, the black and white is automatically going to get rid of any shades of gray or distortion and stuff that's kind of in the background that are later shades of gray. It's going to convert that image to a black and white image. Um, the, the, uh, Color option, you can turn those colors down and all, but you're just going to check off the colors till you get a nice solid feel of your trace color because that's what the lines are going to be drawn around. Okay. All right. So when I trace this image, now I went ahead and turned off that bitmap layer. I don't need it active. But when I trace this image, uh, it, it saved everything and kind of grouped it together. So I want to hit the letter U for ungroup to ungroup everything, or I could have came over here to the edit object tools and ungrouped it. And I want to go ahead and pull this and uh, select this stuff here. And when I go to delete this, all of a sudden, look here. My little teardrop is actually tied to that lower box there, and I don't want that. So that means i got to do some node editing. Node editing is the second icon on the um, Edit Objects tool. And I'm going to go ahead and right-click on this node and cut the vector here. Right-click and cut the vector here. What that's going to do is separate this box from the rest of it. Now I can delete that. And on this open vector, I can go ahead and close it or join, join close with a smooth curve and everything. Okay. Now, if uh, it wasn't quite, you know, a nice curve for me, I could go into node editing mode and I could delete a point here and kind of smooth things out manual you know give me a nice look all right now on this one i'm going to and let's come up here let's see what i've got here i've got one that's got a flat line across the top you know when it traced and everything i want it to be a nice smooth curve so i'm going to remove or delete this point here and then i'm going to take select this node here I'm going to hold down my shift key, select this node here, and I'm going to hit the letter Y on my keyboard because Y represents up and down. And I'm going to move that up so it's in those two are in line with one another. And then I'm going to take this line here and I'm going to turn it into a Bezier. It already is a Bezier curve. So I'm going to come in here and pull these anchors up. And... I'm actually going to take this one and back it up a little bit here. Let's get a nice, <clears throat> let's delete this point here and pull this, whoops, uh, just get a nice little curve going there. There we go. All right. Now, oh, let's get out of node editing mode. I'm going to group that back together. So it's one item. Okay. I'm going to take this object here and group that back together. And I'm going to take this object here and group this back together. Now, of the three, I'm going to take and move them out of the way, all three of them. I'll move them to the side. And I'm going to turn on my spindle TV layer, which is my welcome sign here. Now, on the welcome sign, I drew these rectangles, assuming that I was going to get a flourish to kind of something like this. But I have these flourishes here that also that already have this kind of straight border below them. And so I could actually use those in place of these, but I'm not going to. That would be too easy. I'm going to take this object here and I'm going to show you how to blend all of these things together to come up with a nice looking design. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. All right. Okie dokie. All right. Let's go ahead and um, let's get this centered up on our board. Center, center, center. Alignment tool is the last icon on the transform objects menu. 
we're going to center left to right, get that object centered there. Notice that it's going outside in the border. So I might have to do a little bit of resizing, but that's fine. And um, I'm going to take and go back into my mirror tool. Well, not, I'm not going to mirror it yet. Let's get this one set up, then I'll mirror it. Uh, before I mirror it, let's go to some of the questions. Let's go to the question. We got uh, Jeff jumping in. Does the offset have anything to do with the size of the bit you are using? Yes, it does. Uh, when what, what he's referring to is when I was talking about the 3D cut here and um, what Jeff's referring to is when I was referring to the 3D cut and I said I offset my vectors, my texture vectors away by an eighth of an inch. And let's go, let's look at this texturing toolpath while we're talking about it. If I open it up, you'll see down here at the bottom, this boundary offset, I have it set to an eighth of an inch. And so that is based on the, the you know, the V bit and the bit that I'm using and the ball nose and everything. So basically let's kind of uh let's kind of look at it like this if i have a tapered ball nose bit you know it's got a quarter inch shank it tapers down 11 degree angle let's say my eighth inch tapered bit and everything when it's carving you know, it's just almost the taper bit almost it's a slight angle, but it's almost like a V bit, right? The deeper we go, the wider it gets and everything. Well, um, I want uh, that bit to stay away from my letters and all. And my best bet is to um, try to figure out what my offset is here, where my letters are going to come to, because this is the top of my vectors. This isn't the bottom where it angles down. This is the top. And so let's draw out a V bit. I'm using a 60 degree V bit. So let's draw out that 60 degree V bit here. Space bar to finish. And let's draw a line here. Space bar to finish. All right. So right now this represents my V bit sitting on top of my board. If I were to uh, be cutting down, my project is in this cut here was an eighth of an inch deep. My pocket area was an eighth of an inch deep. So if I move this V bit down relative to its position on the Y axis, negative 0.125, That's going to kind of represent my V bit, you know, cutting down that eighth of an inch. So what I want to do from here is I want to take and measure the horizontal distance. And let me make my text size uh, point oh, 0.65. Um, I want to measure the horizontal distance from this point here to this intersecting point here. And that's going to give me a distance of 0.0722. Okay. So I need to at least be offset by that much or else the bit's going to carve into the bottom part of my letters. All right. So that's a little over a 16th of an inch. Basically I double it, which gave me roughly my eighth of an inch offset. Okay. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. All right, let's close that. And so Jeff, hopefully that answered your question. All right, and um, this is a good question. Tom Shoemaker says, can you get a good results tracing a colored image in a black and white option? Absolutely you can. You're gonna get the same similar results. Um, when it converts it to a black and white, it just gets rid of all of the grayscales and everything, and it's going to bring it down to it. It's just going to, it's just uh, like taking that photo, that image into Photoshop and turning it to a black and white image. It's just uh, recoloring it uh, to a black and white option. And anything that was shades of gray or shades of blue or red light, you know, shades that would represent the grayscale of it is basically converted to a solid black or white. Um, and uh, so, yes, you can absolutely get a good tracing result. 
uh, uh, whether you're using the black and white option or the color option. So good questions. All right, let's get back to where we were here. And so what I want on this is I'd like uh, these two areas here. Let me draw, let me give a, let me get a guideline here. So if with my guideline and everything, I would like this main area here to have a little bit of, you know, an overlap. Um, and possibly here as well, where we've got some blend in, but I want to make sure that I don't lose too much good detail down here when I'm blending things together because a lot of this inner stuff is going to end up getting kind of cut away or deleted, if you will. And, and so one of the things that I can do is I could, uh, you know, uh, take and uh, do some note editing and bring things down, bring things up. I could do some uh, all kinds of things. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the distort tool a bit. And the distort tool, I'm going to go ahead and open it up and I'm going to distort within a bounding box. I'm going to click apply. And what this does for me is no matter how I pull this, it's going to distort, you know, this based on, you know, how I pull my lines. I can add extra points in there. I can turn a line from a Bezier curve, you know, and things like that. And so I can do some, you know, a lot of different distortion. I'm not stuck with just the image that I got. You know, I can come in here and turn this to a Bezier curve and I could flex this up and kind of build this a bit. Right. You know, on the bottom here, I could, you know, bring that in a little. So it's higher than my lower parts here. Right. I could start to kind of uh, play around with that a bit. And so let's go ahead and close this and let's group this back together. I can't group it back together. It's in a bounding box. I'll group it back together in just a minute. But um, I'm going to right click on this and convert it back to curves. And then I'm going to group it back together. There we go. Uh, that takes it out of the bounding box. That takes it out of the, um, the envelope, if you will. So well, with a little bit of distortion now, I can go ahead and uh, move this down. Okay, so now I'm not losing as much as my inner detail and stuff and everything. I'm getting good overlap. Let's go down a little bit more. I'm going to bump that down just a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. All right, now let's make sure I didn't move it around. I, I, I jiggled my mouse a little bit. Let's make sure I'm still centered. I'm still centered. That's good. All right, now that I'm happy with that and everything, um, when I did that distortion and I pulled up my sides, it distorted this little centerpiece a little bit and I want to fix that. Uh, I want to fix that so that, um, oops, I need to ungroup this object here and I want to fix this here. I'm going to delete this point right here in the middle and pull this up a bit and pull this out. One thing I love about the VCarve 10 now, I can actually grab a span and I can control the span and everything now. Um, I don't have to just grab an anchor or a node. Uh, you know, I can grab a span and kind of adjust it a bit. And what I'm doing is I'm just being kind of anal right now. There we go. All right. Okay. All right. Now, before I, before we, let's get rid of this guideline and everything and let's close our texturing tool path and let's kind of zoom in. I'm going to select this here. So we're not looking at all this other stuff. Um, I'm going to select this here and zoom into it. So we're focusing on that. But before we go into the next step, let's go ahead and Trina's got a question. Why did you double the number? Why did I double the number? Um, 
Trina is referring to why did I double this number? Because my V cut, when that, when that text cuts, When that text cuts, let me go into node editing on here. And I'm gonna take this node here, this node here, hit the letter Y on my keyboard to pull them up. When my text cuts, my vector based on my v bit and everything the vector is going to be as you know at the top of the material it's going to angle down and out based on the v bit and in this case it was angling down and out by 0722 so the distance from here from this node here to this point here that offset distance is 0.0722 that angle now, if I offset by that much, then my bit is going to be rubbing against the bottom of my letters, cutting it. So I double it so that not only am I offsetting, you know, that, that certain point, you know, that 0.0722, which brings my bit to here, I'm going away another 0.0722 to bring it away. That way, if we zoom in real tight, my bit clears away from that angle of my letters and all and does not collide into it, cutting up and destroying the look of my letters and things. That's why I doubled my number, Trina. So hopefully that helps clarify. All right, let's um, get back in here and zoom back in. So hopefully that, that helped Trina. All right, now let's uh, take this object here for a moment and group it back together. I'm going to use the group tool over here or the letter G on your keyboard. And now I'm going to mirror this um, and I'm going to mirror it, flipping it about job center. And I'm going to flip it, making a mirror copy. I'm going to flip it vertically and I should land in the same area as here. Wonderful. We're getting there. All right, now that I have my design, I'm going to go ahead and select everything in the middle. You'll see that border gets selected too, but I'm going to turn the border off by holding my shift key and selecting on that border because I want to, I need to size this down. Now I'm going to hold my shift key when I grab this corner block because what that's going to do is going to keep my object centered uh, where it's at and uh, I'll be able to size down. And I'm just literally sizing down just a little bit. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. All right. Now I've got all these overlaps and things and I want to join them together. I want to kind of blend these things together. Um, and there are a couple of tricks that I can do to do that. One, one, I could take my text and convert it to a curve. And while it's a curved object, I could go into my interactive trim tool and I could start trimming away my overlaps, right? Kind of blending that in. Okay, I could do that, but I'm not gonna. I could also take and select both of these boundaries here, these vector borders here, and I could, I could uh, group those together so they act like one item here. And if I come in here, I have a, Trace trim tool, my regular trim tool. Sorry, my regular trim tool. If I come in here and the last object I select is my boundary, right? That's all that I selected my boundary. So if I click on the, the welcome first, and let me group that together. Always want to group, so we're working with two different items. So if I select my welcome first, hold down my shift key and select the boundary last, I can clear everything inside that boundary, right? Everything inside that boundary. And when I clear inside everything inside that boundary, when I click clear, it would 
do this, right, where it saves my vector. But now I got all these overlaps, right? So how can we do that to make it better? Well, let's actually select this first and then the text last. Now the text is my boundary. The text is my boundary. And this time when I come in and clear inside that boundary and I click clear, why aren't you working for me? It's not working for me the way I want to. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not working the way I want it to. So let me come back in here. I, what do I want you to do? Oh, I know what the problem is. I need one boundary, not two. Let me ungroup this. Sorry, folks, ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. We're going to take this rectangle here and we're going to make this rectangle come to here. And we're going to make this rectangle Come to here. A little less. Okay. Get rid of this for a moment. And if I now select my text or my border first and then my text last and I clear in my regular trim tool, I clear inside that boundary. What it will do is it will trace out the text. And so if I literally got rid of the font, you would see the word welcome here. You can, you can make out the word welcome there. So it literally took that rectangle and traced it all around the letters to create that word welcome. And it looks a little odd because we don't have our boxes in here, which I, sh I probably shouldn't have deleted them. I should have left them open. But uh, we don't have our boxes there. Uh, and um, we need to put them back so it kind of will come together. But I had to draw the rectangle as a whole rectangle and overlap the letter slightly to get this kind of outline of my letters. So let's back up and let's look at this again. I'm going to come back to where I was here. Okay. And what I'll do is I'm going to take and make this rectangle here. Let's move this up a little bit. Okay. Let's move this one down a little bit. And I'm going to draw a new rectangle. And on this new rectangle, I need to make sure that this new rectangle overlaps my letters a little bit. Let me zoom in. I want to kind of just, I, want, I don't want too big of an overlap. Not too small of one either. There we go. And down here, just a little bit more of an overlap. I'm um, looking at this line right here, kind of giving me that reference point. Okay. And then I'm going to, uh, once again, select my rectangle first, my text last, trim tool, clear inside the boundary. The text is the boundary. So it's going to clear everything inside of it. Well, it's got to draw it somewhere. So what it's going to do is when it clears the inside, it's going to redraw to connect the vector and it's going to basically trace that font. So when I click clear, it'll redraw and trace that font and I can close that tool. And now I can turn off or get rid of the font and I've got my little outline. Welcome. Welcome. Now I'm going to take this object here. 
Actually, I'm going to take this object here and I'm going to delete it. I'm going to take this object here and I'm going to lower it down. So I get a little bit of an overlap. Okay. And then I'm going to mirror that, flipping it vertically. So I should have a little bit of overlap on that one. Everything should be nice and centered. You can start to make out the word welcome again, real clear, you know, welcome. All right, now I've got to weld these objects together. So I'm gonna take this object here and all of my overlapping vectors, all my vectors that are overlapping, except for the center of this O here, because it's not touching either one, right? So I want all of my overlapping vectors and this one too. And I should, this one too, and I should be able to weld them into one item up here. It would have helped if I would have, let me undo that. Let me do the bottom one too. <laughs> weld that together. No, that's not what I want. The weld gets rid of everything that I want, everything that is good and holy. I want to keep it. So what I need to do is simply do some interactive trimming. Interactive trimming. So what I need to do is on this uh, border here, Basically, my letters are going to be tying into that border, right? So I'm, is that going to give me, let me see here. I'm trimming the wrong lines. I trim that letter. Trim that. There we go, Haas. That's what we're looking for. Uh, trim that and that. There we go. I'm tying the word welcome into my border. So we're trimming this line and that one. Uh, this line. So I'm trimming the top lines of the letters so they blend into this border up here. And then getting rid of this little line right here. So the top of my letter, get rid of the little line. Top of my letter, top of my letter, get rid of this little line, get rid of that little line. Top of my letter, get rid of that little line. This little line of mine, this little line of mine. <laughs> That's not the right words. All right, let's get rid of this one and this little line. And the line, that the line. So now I should have the word welcome blended in to this border up here. So it's like kind of part of the part of the part of the Part of the border, part of the border. That's right. Yes. All right. One more time. This little line. Oops. Little line. This, the bottom of my text, little line. Bottom of my text, little line. All the way down. And I'm not going to say little line anymore because it's getting irritated. So that and that. Rinse and repeat. All the way across. Okay. So we did have to do a little bit of interaction, a little interactive trimming. Never hurt nobody. Oops, wrong line. Oops, wrong line. Zoom in when it when it when it can't pick the right line. Zoom in to the object uh, to oh wrong line. Zoom into it so it'll click the right object, and then we should be able to go here. So now I've got uh, you know we're getting there. We're getting there. Let's zoom in to this. Let's close this tool. We, we still haven't connected the flourishes. I'm going to do some interactive trimming with that as well. But let's, um, let's zoom in here. And so, you know, what I want to happen and what will happen is going to be two different things. But right now, I, these little guys right here are just floating. Now they're going to be connected to this border here, but they're kind of floating into uh, this design right here, or, you know, they're, they're not really connected. I want to tie these together. Um, so 
I'm basically going to ungroup this object. And what's my next question? Um, yes, the bounding box uh, on the distort, right? On the distort, the bounding box. We can, we can definitely go over that. I'm going to take these objects here, these guys, okay? And all I'm going to do is just pull them down a bit. Pull them down a little bit so I get a little bit of an overlap. Them away. Just to get a little bit of an overlap because, uh, and um, this one I'm actually going to let float free. Uh, but that way when I'm in here, I can trim away to make those teardrops or whatever they are kind of part of this fine design, you know? And then of course I'm going to be trimming away these designs here to kind of make them part of that border. So they're tied in there over here. Same thing. I'm going to be trimming that away and this away. And then I'll point out the bounding box when we get back to the distort. Uh, give me just one second on that, uh, Jeff, and we will jump on that. Jump on that. Jump on that. Same thing. I'm going to close this tool for a minute and I'm going to go ahead and take this and I'm going to pull this down just a little bit just to get a little bit of an overlap. Not too much. A small bit of overlap. And uh, pull that away a little bit. And I'm going to interactively trim this. Now, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to trim the top one. Uh, I'm too lazy for that. You know, why trim what you can copy? I'm only going to have to do this one time. You know, I'm going to get this bottom one. I, you know, I could have done the top or the bottom, but I'm going to get this bottom one right, tight and right. And uh, let's trim this and this, that and that. So one more over here, little sneaky Pete over there and over here. All right. All right. Now, here's where my ultimate, ultimate laziness comes out of. You ready for this? All right. First of all, I need to delete this span, right? And I need to delete this span, right? Right. But before I do, this span and everything is not connected yet, and neither is this one up here. So what that means for me is that I can select all of this down here. Wait for it, wait for it. I can group that together, and then I can select all of this up here, group that together. And then my laziness is I'm going to delete this up here. And one more time, I'm going to mirror this one. Let's mirror that. Flipping it vertically about job center. And now there's no trimming I got to do up there. Right now, the only trimming I need to do is, oh, it's not going to let me trim that one. Uh, go into node editing mode and I'm going to right click and delete this span. Delete this span. Right, right. And now I got a little bit of an overlap right there, right? So trim. Now notice if my scissors won't open. Why won't it open? Because I'm still grouped together, right? On these two objects, they're still grouped together. Ungroup them so you can snip, snip, snip. Okay. All right. So if I select my design, 
Um, we can go ahead and get rid of these now. Delete those and get rid of this. If I select my design or right click select, select all open vectors, I should have no open vectors in my design. Okay. All right. Oh, oh thanks, Tippy. Tippy says, hey, you missed part of your teardrops there. Teardrops are falling. I did. And I've also got to connect these down here. I'm not going to connect those. I'll leave those blank. But let's go over here and let's, uh, I got to trim. These two guys right here on both the top and bottom because I overlooked them. It would have come clear when I did the preview, but thanks, Tippy. All right. Wonderful. Let's group this together. We've got a nice looking little welcome sign. We haven't done our texture or anything around this yet and all. Um, but uh, got a nice looking sign. Let's let's V carve this without a texture and let's see what it looks like. And but oh, hold on. Before we go into the tool path and V-carve, let's go back and answer a question. Um, let's see here. William says, what about weld? Would the weld tool have worked? Um, the weld tool would have worked, but it would have removed some of the things that I didn't want to do, just like it did with the uh, when I did the welcome sign, uh, William. Uh, so uh, weld tool works uh, great for many things, but a lot of times, sometimes it'll get rid of things that I don't want to get rid of. So that's why I just went ahead and instead of welding, I used the, the regular trim tool to subtract. And then I just went ahead and interactively trimmed because, um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to it. And I knew that I was going to be only doing one side and then copying it over. So there was just a very little bit of trimming. So uh, went well. But yeah, you could definitely, uh, you could have definitely used the weld in that aspect. Um, Jeff says, can you point out the bounding box or is it not visible? So when we have an object, And I'll use I'll use a text object here. Hello world. When we have an object, whether it be text or a vector object, when we distort that object within a bounding box, if you look very closely, you will see a faint dotted line. And at the corners of those lines and in the center points of those lines, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's like nodes. So if I pull this center point out, my text is going to follow suit. You know, if I pull this corner node up, my text is going to follow suit. If I take this span, this dotted line, and I right click on it and turn it into a arc, my text is going to follow suit. Hello, world. Pull that back down. Let's pull this corner up a little bit. I got that arc to work with so I can kind of pivot a little, you know, and I can have all kinds of fun. Uh, let's take the bottom one here and turn it to a busy A curve and let's give the bottom a little bit of a curve. Mm, let's go up this way. Hello world. Okay. Now when I'm when I'm clicked off of it, there's no bounding box. But when I click on it again, that little faint dotted line. Let's get it on the whiteboard. Let me turn off. Uh, let me move this to another layer and then turn it off so you can see it on the whiteboard. Uh, let's go um, select this move to a new layer. I'm just going to call that layer two for the moment and click OK. I'm going to come in here and turn off my image trace layers. And uh, we'll take Hello World 
and when I come into node edit, you see that faint dotted line around, and that line, anywhere on that line, those lines, all four sides, I can insert points, and then I could, you know, uh, let's insert a point there, and let's insert a point here, and the line or the span between those two points instead of an arc, I could turn that into a line, right? Um, I could point this up to where it's like a house, you know what I mean? Or instead of a line, I could turn it, I could delete, oops, I could delete this point here and turn this span into a busy a curve. And then I could kind of get jiggy with it, you know? And that's the distort tool. And we can distort objects or text. So we're not stuck with the cookie cutter old text and everything. We can have some fun with our distort tool. And then imagine distorting this and then adding some other decorative elements, maybe some vine work or something in here. Bam! Creativity, right? Cool stuff. All right. But that's where the bounding box is. And let's go back into our layer here. And... William Wallace pops up the question, is the bottom O a line? William, which O? My O in welcome? Let me know which O we're referring to. And maybe like if you're referring to hello world, what we were just talking about. But let me know and we'll get back to that question. Let me know which one you're referring to, the bottom O as far as alignment. But all right, so now... We're going to move over here and we're going to um, come in. I, ain't, I haven't done the texture yet. We're just going to do a very simple V carve and, 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 and all and all. We're going to do a very simple V carve tool patch just to see what this would look like to see if I'm going to be happy with it or not. I'm going to start at zero and I'm going to have a flat depth of an eight of an inch. Now, when I do raised text, you know, you can go deep and have, you know, the deeper you go, the wider your letters get at the bottom and everything. I personally, I'm, I'm a 0.15 or 0.125 kind of guy when I'm doing race text. I like the way that looks. It's a nice, elegant, clean look uh, and everything. But you can make that pocket, this pocket cut when it mills all this stuff away as deep as you want. Okay. But we have to keep in mind, I'm not going to have a router bit small enough to get into a lot of these areas and things and everything. So my V bit's going to have to take over and clean those areas out and everything. But that being said, I could use a smaller V-bit or what have you. Uh, I'm going to use a 60-degree V-bit. And for my clearance tool, my flat area clearance tool, clearing all this stuff away, I'm going to use um, a eighth-inch end mill. Try to get as close uh, within these letters and all that I can. So zero start depth, eighth-inch flat depth. Flat depth is a limit, not a cut depth. It's a limit. It's going to limit the cut to an eighth of an inch. I'm going to use my 60 degree V bit and my eighth inch end mill to do this. I'm going to be offsetting. It's going to be a more optimized toolpath for me. And I'm going to hit calculate. All right, let's reset our preview. And if we preview this visible toolpath, it's going to take a second. Now, William came back and said, in the welcome line, uh, in the welcome run line across, um, so is the bottom O line in the welcome? Oh, run a line across. So he's, okay. So this would be my this would be my welcome sign with just a simple uh, you know that raised effect, pretty nice looking. I want a little bit more depth and definition on that V cut right here between these guys right here. So I'm actually going to go back into that toolpath, and I'm actually going to give myself about a 0 0.02, twenty thousandths of an inch start depth. I'm going to recalculate that.
what that's going to do is it's making them, it's going to make my bit go down and cut uh, a little 20 thousandths of an inch deeper. And that way, when I preview that toolpath, I'm going to get a little bit more definition out of these areas in here. Okay. Um, but yeah, let me run when this is finished, we'll move over and we'll run a line and I'll, he's asking if my O aligned is the bottom O aligned. And I'm still not sure which O it is, but we'll go from there. All right, you see here, I've got a lot better definition in those uh, little teardrop cuts and everything than what they were. Um, you know, I've got a lot better definition in those cuts and everything. And let's uh, get this centered back up and come back over here. All right, uh, so he is saying in the welcome, run line across, run line across. Bear with me a second. I'm assuming, oh, what are we looking for there, bud? What, uh, William, I'm sorry, a little bit, uh, can you, can you kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant tonight. It's been a long day. Can you spell out what you're trying to say to me, uh, you know, and, and, and that way I can make sense of what I'm doing. Um, Cause I honestly, I, I'm not sure. Welcome, welcome the word, welcome run line across. I have no idea what that means. Uh, and I'm sorry about that. Um, what does the tile tilt tittle title character next to the node editing tool pointer mean again? Um, let's go back over to node editing. Oops. What does the, I'm going to pull this one up for you guys. What does the title character next to the node editing tool pointer mean again? Um, is that this one here and, uh, the one for transform mode? Here's the node editing tool. What does the character next to the node editing tool mean? Unless I'm in the node editing tool, you're talking about the character, that little, oh, the tidal wave, the, 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 yeah, sorry. Um, that is just, uh, letting me, uh, no, basically I can, I'm on a span and I can turn that span into an arc or a curve. I can busy it, you know, and turn it to an arc or a curve. So it's just letting me know that I'm on a span. Okay. So when I'm on a no, but when I'm on a span, that character will come up. Sorry. Took me a minute to, again, it's, it's been a long day. So uh, it took me a minute, but that little, uh, title character, like a little title wave. Uh, that's just showing me that I can turn it into a node or, uh, you know, arc or span or, you know, do something. I'm on my mouse pointer is on a span and I can turn it to an arc or a curve. Okay. Great question, Grant. Sorry it took me. I'm a little slow on the uptake on that one, buddy. All right. Um, is there a difference between uh, adding a start depth and cut depth set? Okay. Here's the deal in a toolpath, in most all the toolpaths, your profile toolpath, pocket toolpath, your drilling toolpath, um, your quick engraving toolpath, fluting toolpath, prism carbon toolpath, you have a cut depth. So if I open up a pocket toolpath, we have a cut depth, basically saying, hey, start here, in this case, zero at the top of my board, and cut down. <coughs> Start here, the top of my board, and then cut down to this depth, okay? So that's a cut depth. Now, if I tell it to start at 0.02, then that means I'm telling it to start 0.02 below the surface of my board because the surface of my board is zero. So I want it to cut lower, and then I want it to cut down, in this case, one inch that's on the screen. I want to cut down one inch from that point. So I want to start two thousandths of an inch 
into the surface of my board from zero. I want to go down there and then I want to cut one inch down. If we look at this, the cut depth is one inch in this case on this pocket. So if I started, if I started at 0 0.0625 and then cut down, and that means my bit is going to start cutting. It's going to plunge down to 0 0.0625 below the surface of the board. And then from that point, it's going to cut one inch. Okay. So in the case of a V carve toolpath, the V carve toolpath automatically calculates the depth of cut based on the angle of the bit. So it looks at the space between two lines and it automatically calculates how deep it needs to cut for those two lines to meet at a V based on the angle of the bit. So a 90 degree V bit would be a shallower cut than a 60 degree V bit than a 22 degree V bit, you know? But in some cases when you're cutting and the line spacing is really wide in the case of like the, you know, in the E or, you know, the um, M and things like that, or the line between the border and the design. If I do not set a flat depth, then my, my, my design would want to cut through the material. And so a flat depth is a limit. It's saying you're, it's, you're limiting the cut. So any part of that design that would normally exceed my limit of an eighth of an inch here, it's going to flatten it. It's going to limit that cut to an eighth of an inch and limit it. But all the other parts of the design, all the other parts of the design that are um, not going to reach or exceed that eighth of an inch, they're going to get cut to whatever depth they're going to go to. Now, if I add in that start depth, if I add in that start depth, OK, it's going to limit the cut to the eighth of an inch from that start depth. So if we come over to my 3D view here and let's let's hide this comment for a second so we can see the bottom of the screen. If we focus our attention to the bottom of the screen right here, if I hover my mouse over the top of the board and the top of my board is 0.75. Why is it 0.75? Because I'm starting from the bottom. My waste board is zero, right? And my board's three quarters of an inch thick. If I come in to here, okay, the depth of cut is 0 0.605, which is the 0.125 minus the 0 0.02. So an eighth of an inch from three quarters would be 0.625, right? But I'm starting at 0.02 from the top. I'm making the bit plunge that much deeper. So my cut depth is 0.605, which is in this case, instead of an eighth of an inch, it's 0.145, if you will. 0.145, if you will. Okay. I know that's confusing, but I'm starting from the bottom. But, uh, you know, uh, the top of your board is zero when you're touching off on the surface of the material. And then, you know, I'm limiting the cut to an eighth of an inch, which is an eighth of an inch cut. And if I did the math, you know, because the software is showing me that top of my board is 0.75. The top of your board, if you were touching off on the top, would be zero. And... Um, I'm starting 20 thousandths of an inch lower and cutting down to an eighth of an inch. So technically my cut depth from the very top of my board is 0.145 inches deep, right? But since I'm working with Z0 of the waste board, it's 0.605 inches deep. I don't want that to confuse you. It just depends on where you're working from. But it's a limit. An eighth of an inch is a limit cut. Yes. So once again, let's, uh, he's asking if the start depth would improve detail. Let me show you here. Let me go back to a zero start depth and I want you to focus. Okay. On this on, let me turn this sideways a little bit. 
I want you to focus on these teardrop areas right here. Let me see if I can bring that down. All right, focus on these teardrop areas right here. If I recalculate this toolpath back to with a zero start depth, Oh, I got to select my vectors first. Hold on a second. Hold on. Calculate. Let it calculate. Yes. All right. So let's reset this preview and preview those visible tool paths again. And uh, uh, few people jumped in. Um, let's see here. Yes. Uh, give me a second and I'll answer those questions. While that's calculated, let me answer the questions. So uh, real quick, Bob in Kansas says, when you added the clearance tool, can you add a second larger tool? Absolutely. You can use multiple clearance tools in version 10 now. Your earlier versions, 9, 9.5, 8 and all, uh, you can only use one clearance tool, uh, flat area clearance tool. But in version 10, you can add multiple clearance tools to help speed up the process. So I could use a quarter inch clearance tool to do all the quarter inch areas an eighth inch clearance tool to do all the eighth inch areas. And then, you know, yes. And so, um, yes, Bob, you can. Now, Cecil and William are kind of helping me out here, but real quick, I want to kind of focus back on this. I want you to look at this uh, very faint detail in, in this uh, carving right here in these till drop areas with a zero start depth. So the lines were very close together so they didn't carve very deep, you know, so I want to add a little bit more depth to that. I'm going to go back into that tool path and I'm going to give myself a small amount, 20 thousandths of an inch. And I'm going to recalculate that. And while that's calculating, William helped me out here and he said, get a close up on the O in the welcome and run a guideline across it. OK, uh, and so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, as soon as this is finished calculating. Now, if I reset this preview and I preview that visible toolpath, I want you to focus on those areas and all. And then uh, William with William's question about the guidelines, Cecil jumps in and Cecil says, think when you did the interactive trim, maybe you did the wrong line in the O. Uh, and then also he says, uh, didn't V10 allow multiple clearance tools? So that was a two-parter. Um, so it was a two-parter. But now as we look, you can see that our carve is much more defined in here just with that little 20 thousandths of an inch cut depth. We got a little bit more definition in our lines here. Let's go back over here and um, when I uh, was, what William Wallace says is, and I'm assuming they're assuming they're talking about the O and welcome. Um, you're thinking that I trimmed away the wrong line in the O and there was only one line. Why am I not seeing what you guys see? He says, run a guideline. On the O, I'm going to run one at the bottom too. Right there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. William, you're, man, you got good eyes, brother. And Cecil, thanks for uh, uh, helping all that. William, you got freaking good eyes, brother, uh, to be able to catch that. That's awesome. Holy cow. All right. So we're going to fix that. <laughs> wow. William's got great eyes. Okay, man. All right. So William, all this time you're saying, Hey, I think you trimmed the wrong line on the O and I'm like, I didn't see it. And right here is what he's talking about. I didn't trim 
the correct line, I trimmed away the lower line that was there and, um, and William caught it just that quick. Bam. He's like Hawkeye over there. So let's fix that. Now we've got to go in here and I'm going to ungroup this. So I have, you know, an ungroup vector and I'm going to go into node editing mode. Let's go, let's switch out of the toolpath side for a moment. Man, that was good guys. Good catch. Um, I'm going to go into node editing mode and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, cut the vector here and I'm going to cut the vector here. And I'm going to take this uh, vector and I'm just going to simply pull it down to this line and I'm actually going to extend it out a little bit longer than I need to, but enough. And then I'm going to use my extend tool right here and I'm going to extend this line down to there. And I'm going to extend this line over to here and then let's get rid of that guideline. So you can see that left me with this little overlap and I'm going to come in and trim that away to bring that down. So now when I snap to this, my O is, is correct. Good catch William Wallace. Excellent eyes on that one, brother. Now, even though I used my extend tool to extend that out, that vector is still open. So I need to go into the join tool and I've got, oh no, it closed it for me automatically. Excellent, so it's closed. Awesome, oh, because I trimmed it. I trimmed it with the scissors. Um, let me untrim that. Okay. When I use the extend tool to extend this line to here and the extend tool to extend this line to here, even though, even if I wouldn't have had an overlap, let's say that I didn't have an overlap and you know, I, it, it trimmed to there, it would still be an open vector and we would want to go in and um, close it up, right? Close it up. But because I had this line, because I had this line extended past, and I trimmed it with the scissors, it automatically closed that vector for me. Okay, very cool. All right, so, all right. Thanks, William. Thanks, uh, Cecil, for jumping in on that. And uh, thanks, thanks. Wait, Dave, Dave Garbett jumps in and says, and the M, and the M. Did I, did I miss up the M too? Let me snap to this. Oh yeah, that leg of the M, that leg of the M. Yeah. All right, cool. We're all fixed up now. Thanks guys. All right, now, when we're talking about this V-carb toolpath, when we're talking about this V-carb toolpath here, uh, we're talking about this. We got a new window here in the VCAR toolpath in VR version 10 where we can add multiple clearance tools. So if I want to come in with a, a quarter inch end mill or even a half inch end mill or something, um, I can add in additional clearance tools. Now what that's going to do when I calculate the toolpath, it's going to give me three files my clearing toolpath for the um, quarter inch bit, my clearing toolpath, and let me, first of all, <laughs> it would help if I reselected my vectors. There we go. Let's try that one more time, ladies and gentlemen. Calculate. Let that recalculate. Mm -hmm. Almost there. All right. We have three toolpaths now. We have our clearance toolpath with the quarter inch end mill. We have the clearance tool path with the eighth inch end mill that's gonna come back and do all the little stuff where the quarter inch end mill couldn't get to. 
And if I had a 16th, I could add that in and get even tighter, right? I do have a 16th. I could even, I mean, I can add unlimited number of clearance tools and then we'll have our VBIT. So that uh, could help reduce our run time. So let's look at it. Let's, let's come in here and let's look at it without the second clearance tool, how I was originally doing it. All right. And if we calculate this toolpath, let's look at that run time. And you guys keep asking questions, pop them in there. Um, all right. So let's look at the run time on this. Uh, <clears throat> here, based on my speeds and feeds and everything, we're looking at about a two hour run time, right? And Let's go back in there and let's add in that additional clearance tool. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and uh, let's select and add that in. And I have a 16th inch end mill, so I'm actually gonna select a 16th and, and do a little bit of finer touch up, right? And it puts them in order based on their size. Let's calculate that tool path. We're gonna have four files to run because of the clearance tools. We're gonna have one for the quarter inch and mill, eighth inch, 16th, and then our V bit, V tool. But let's see how long that two hour run was reduced down by using those additional clearance tools. It's coming along. It's coming along. Okay. And so let's, let's take a look real quick. Let's see here. Um, my quarter inch end mill is going to do a majority of the work, you know, wherever it can fit in things. My eighth inch end mill is going to come back in and touch up those areas where the uh, quarter inch bit couldn't fit. And then my 16th is going to come in and touch up the areas where my eighth couldn't fit. So if we take these tool paths here, one, two, and three, and our V bit, and look at our time, um, what were we at before? We can eliminate, I forget what our time was before, two hours and something, but now we're at 237. Hmm. Let me see what my past steps are real quick. Let me change that past step to a 16th. <clears throat> change that to an eighth and that should be an eighth let me calculate that down again <clears throat> one last time and then we'll move on all right so David uh, Kenzie's got a question that uh, we're going to answer here in just a second. All right, let's go in and let's look at our time. Yeah, that's more appropriate. So 10 minutes, 34 minutes, 31 minutes. So my 16 or my V bit is going to be 31 minutes. My 16th inch in mill is going to take about 34 minutes. If I add that in 10 and 18 now, 134, that's with the three bits, 134. Let's take the 16th out of the equation, 134. Calculate that out. Cause I'm going to be putting a texture in here and all of this other little stuff is going to be virtually invisible. So I don't need to go down 
to a sixteenth of an inch end mill, but let's go in our time. And so without the sixteenth inch end mill, we're down to 105. You know, so another 30 minutes off by not using that little micro bit. You know, 105. So yes, you can use multiple clearance tools. And let's go ahead and preview this preview. Visible tool pass, let that go through. And while that's previewing, let's pop up David's question here. And so back to Tippy's question, as demonstrated, you are creating and running two tool paths, the first original cut depth and the second 0.02 deeper. Can you just create one tool path with a deeper cut for the final tool path? Uh, there is no second tool path. They're all, it's all one. This is one V card. 0.02 with a, with a start depth of 0.02. So uh, there's two tool paths in the sense that there's a V bit and an end mill, but it's starting from 0.02. So uh, there is no first original cut depth. You know, if I go back, David, and I do my original zero start depth and all, and then I come in with a second tool path at 0.02, uh, that would, I'd be carving the same sign twice. So it's kind of redundant. Um, what we have is one tool path and forget these up here. These are, these are a different sign up here. I'm talking about this V card tool path right here. This is the one that has a start depth of 0.02 with a cut depth of 0.125. It's the only tool path I'm running for this sign. The tool paths up above that are for the other textured sign. The other, the, what we first showed when I first opened up the program. Those are ones I created earlier uh, and stuff. We're doing this one here. So when we preview, when we preview this uh, visible tool path and stuff with our quarter inch end mill and our eighth inch end mill, we get a lot more better clearance and all. Now, now I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to delete these tool paths that aren't applicable. So that way it's not confusing. That was that home is our welcome to our home sign. Okay, we only have these tool paths, quarter inch end mill, eighth inch mill, V bit, 0.02 start depth. That gives me a little bit more definition in these fluted areas here, these little, these little flower areas. All right, so we got a pretty cool little sign here. Let's get some texturing in there and see if we can make it pop. Okay, so with these vectors selected, I'm gonna go into my texturing tool path and let's turn off David. Hopefully David that clarified and you didn't think I was running two tool paths, one with an original depth and one with a, with a start depth. It's one tool path. William says, uh, still have to re-zero and change the bit. Yes, when you're running multiple tool paths, you set your X, Y, and Z zero for that first bit. And then every bit after that, you're only resetting Z or retouching off Z for each new bit. You leave X and Y alone. Yes. Yeah, Cecil saved a lot of time on the running. Um, if, and so Jeff comes back and says, if you use the set zero to your material bed, does that mean regardless of what you set your depth of cut, it will not go any further than 0.75? Yeah. So if I, unless I set it for one inch, um, yeah, it's still going to go down to zero. So if I, if I have a three quarter inch board and I want it to cut from you know, uh, one inch deep, it's going to raise up to my three quarters above my three quarters, the thickness of my material. And it's going to cut down and it's going to cut down into my waste board if I do that. But if I set, if I tell it to cut through three quarters of an inch, it's going to raise up above my material because I work out the bottom and it's going to cut from 
three quarters to zero. So, um, I don't know. I've never been ballsy enough to try uh, that, Jeff, to, uh, to give it a one-inch start depth because I don't want to spoil my spoil board, but I'll have to give that a try and see if I give it a one-inch cut depth if it raises up to one inch and then cuts down or what. It should. It should always cut to zero and never below zero, but don't quote me on that until I do give it a test. Again, I've never been ballsy enough because I don't want to cut into my waste board. But I'll give that a try, and I'll get back to you on that one in the next class because that's a good question. All right. Until the new machine comes out. Yes, we have a new machine coming out uh, this year, uh, a uh, 36 by automatic tool changer. Very excited about that. Very cool. Very sorry. So, 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 very happy about that. All right, let's get our textures going here. Let's open up our texturing tool path. And for this texturing tool path, I want to start at the bottom of my pocket, right? Which is one, four, five, because I, I added that little 20 thousandths of an inch start depth on the other cut. So my bottom of my pocket is at one, four, five. And I'm going to be using my eighth inch tapered ball nose. I like using the ball nose. It gives a nice little texture and stuff. Now in here, I can play around with these variables to create some really unique textures. And one of my favorite textures is a maximum cut depth of an eighth of an inch, a maximum cut length of one inch with a minimum of roughly 0.325, you know, I had it at 3.6, but 0.325. Yeah, so it's a minimum or a maximum. It varies between one inch and three eighths. My overlap, how my lines overlap each other when that bit is cutting, uh, I let them overlap about 15 to, you know, 10 to 15 percent. And uh, with a variation of 50 percent, so it'll overlap, it'll vary, you know, between that 15 percent and 50 percent. Um, my step over, how far that bit steps over when it's cut, I step over half the diameter of the tip of the bit, which is a sixteenth of an inch. And again, these numbers are, you can play with, around with them and you can change them to anything to get different looks. And I'll do that after we create this first one. I'm going to go a little bit, instead of straight across, I'm going to go a little bit of an angle, an eighth degree angle. And I want that tip of that bit to stay away from my material by an eighth of an inch. Okay, because, you know, nothing's changed from earlier today. So I'm going to go ahead and calculate that toolpath. Let it calculate out. You guys keep those questions coming because we're going to end at 930 tonight. I have to go to... Uh, um, a remodel house and, 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 and do some work over on another house and uh, I'm going to get out of here early tonight. All right. So looking at this toolpath, a lot of people, when they first do a texture toolpath, they kind of freak out a bit because those red lines are right over the uh, letters and all. Does that mean that my bit's going to cut those letters and everything? The blue area is the area that's going to carve. The red area is where the router bit is raising up above the material and moving from one place to another. And the green lines are the router up and down motions, okay? So the blue area is where it's gonna cut. So when you see your design, when those letters are red, don't panic. It's just the router bit is cutting in between, uh, then it's raising up, moving over to the next area, coming down and raising up, moving over to the next area, cut down, all that stuff. So don't panic. All right, let's go ahead and let's give this thing a little bit of a texture. All in all, not a bad looking little sign, right? 
took some text, a little nice little flourish, uh, some rectangles and blended it all together. Created our little boundary with some offset uh, internal radius corners. And uh, in itself, by itself, without a texture, it was a nice looking sign. Add a little bit of texture in there and, um, you know, look really well. Now, let's let's take it a step further. Let's go back into that texture toolpath and let's play with our numbers one time. But before I do, I like these settings. So I'm going to save these settings. And what this is going to do, it's going to open up my vector, vector texture folder. And it's going to allow me to save this so that I can load it into a new project another day, right? So I'm going to call this my uh, point 0.125 by 8, I'm going to do a small x, by 8 degree, that's the angle of my cut, um, texture. That's the angle down here, that 8 degree, okay? My 0.125 is my ball nose. Let me put a B in there. Ball nose. Uh, with an eight degree uh, angle of cut. Uh, I like that, so I'm gonna save that. Now, by default, you have two textures already in there, a default V texture and a hand carved looking texture that you can load into this texturing tool path. But if I have a new job and I want to add a texture and I like that texture, I can simply hit load and I can select the parameters, you know, what I like, what I've created or what's original. And I can load them in there. Let's do the hand carved texture. We'll load that in there. Those parameters, right? Those parameters. And let's see what the hand carved texture looks like. Tool Junkie, can you cross-hatch uh, the angle of the texture patch uh, path? No. No, you can't. Um, the question is, can you cross-hatch the angle of the texture path? And unfortunately, no, you cannot. All right, let's reset this preview and uh, let's preview all the tool paths. And let's see what we get. All right. All right. Two hours, six minutes. So this one's a little bit of a faint, lighter texture. It's straight across. There's no angle or anything in there. And it's just a very light texture, almost like a little bit of, chis like I took a little spoon chisel in there and just kind of pulled out some areas and all, kind of giving it a little bit of a hand textured look. That to me looks like a um, uh, rice paper mat, uh, no wait, that's not the right term. Um, Looks like a little mat to me of sorts, uh, you know, a little light texture in the background, which is really nice. So that's a completely different look and everything. So, all right, let's look at our time on running this, and then we're going to end with any couple of last minute couple of questions you have, and then we're going to say good night. Um, but let's look at our time. And... Rochelle, if you were if you were guessing how long it takes with that two hours and six minutes that you threw up in the chat, you were close. Two hours and twenty six minutes. You were only off by twenty minutes on that texture, on that whole car from start to finish. All right, all right. So now that we have our tool pass, and go ahead and uh, we save them. Save. Tool pass, whatever your post processor is for your machine, you're going to use. 
And we'll start off with our quarter inch end mill. Save that. And in this case, uh, I'm going to go to Documents, CNC Jobs, New Folder. This is going to be my Welcome Sign 2. With texture, because I'll do it with and without a texture. Um, and for this is the first full pass, so I'm going to give it a number, 01. That lets me know this is the first file that I'm going to be running. My board is a 20 by 12 by 0.75 piece of material. This is the welcome with texture file. And uh, this is a 0.25 end mill. Okay, that's going to be my first file. Save that. I'm going to select this second one here. Save toolpath. Now, I'm going to single click on this file name up here in this existing file that I just saved. So it puts the name up here because the only thing that's going to change is this number 01 is going to change to 2. And this bit is going to change from a quarter inch end mill to an eighth inch end mill. Hit save. Come down here and my VCAR toolpath, save that. Single click on this, that number there, that two is gonna change to a three, and this is gonna get removed out, and it's a 60 DEG V bit. Save that. And lastly, but not leastly, save that toolpath. And this is going to be four, and it's a 0.125 ball nose. And I'm going to actually add an underscore here, and I'm going to add in. Not an under, uh, I'm going to add an underscore, and I'm going to add in optional, optional. So what this tells me for myself is that I can run this with or without the texture. Okay, the texture is kind of optional. It's a nice looking sign without it, nice looking sign with it. So I just put the word optional and that lets me know, you know, I don't necessarily have to run that number four toolpath. It's optional. If I want a texture, I run it. If I don't, I don't. All right. All right. All right. Let's see here. Uh, let's come in to uh, Dave. Uh, Dave says, Laney, I've done a couple of texture signs and used gel stain thinned with water and applied with a Q-tip. Came out really nice. Just wanted to pass that on. That is a great little tip. I'm going to have to give that a try. So basically, you took your gel stain, diluted it a little bit, and then a Q-tip, uh, you kind of uh, basically accented that texture in the background. Nice, Dave. Really nice. That's a good. That's a good little tip. Thanks for sharing that one. Thanks for sharing that one. All right. Let me look over here on my dashboard and let me make sure that uh, I didn't miss a question. Okay. All right. Things are looking good. Nice. Very nice. All right. Any last questions, guys? Let's go ahead and type them in now and let's hammer them home. I, I, I These were all great questions, uh, but uh, it, it's open form. It's an open Q&A. So it could be about any of the software or anything. Just let me know and I'll answer. But we're going to it's it's 922. We're going to end at 930. Uh, so we've got another eight minutes. And um, let's go ahead and we've got another eight minutes. Let's go ahead and uh, hammer home some questions if you got any. Otherwise, in eight minutes, we're going to say uh, good night. But hopefully you like this now. It's a simple sign. We know how to make signs by now, I'm sure, right? But it's kind of, uh, you know, taking things 
you know, I wanted to really show you how we could take that flourish and, and distort it, you know, just like we distorted the hello world text, we can distort objects too. And so I distorted that object, that flourish to help me uh, achieve what I wanted to. And also, it also gave a little bit extra body and stuff and everything. So play around with that distort tool, have some fun with it and um, uh, it'll be good. All right, and I want to, uh, everybody that's popping up and saying thank you, uh, you're welcome. Um, but I got, here's a question, I think, I believe. How and where do you save your flourish work? That is a great question. How and where do you save your flourish work? So, on those flourishes that I've traced, uh, and even, you know, on, you know, before I normally, which I didn't end up having to trace this one again. Uh, but here's what I do. Um, on the flourishes, I really only need, because all of this is kind of working for me on this one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into node editing for a quick moment. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to come in right here and cut the vector. And right here and cut the vector. And then I'm going to take this flourish here and I'm going to group it together for a moment. And I'm going to go to file, export, export as a DXF. that selected area. And then I'm going to go into my uh, C drive, users, public, public document, Vetric files. And I'm going to go into my clip art. And I'm going to go to custom. And this is going to be my flourish border, and I'll uh, I'll put a one in there. Flourish border one, and I'll click save, and then I'm going to come back in here. And I'm going to take this uh, and I'm going to ungroup it first. And I'm going to select this here again. And I'm just going to very simply go back to my join tool. And I'm going to close that back up to fix that. You know, join that back up. Now, where did that go? Let's, let's save my files. And by the way, guys, don't do as I did. Uh, you should save early and save often. I had not saved anything. I was just kind of rocking through it and did not save anything. But we're going to do that now. File save as. Uh, I'm going to go into my documents, CNC jobs, welcome home sign, and welcome with texture. And click save. And I got some other questions popping up. Great. Great, great, great. All right. Now, what I, the reason why I'm going to save that is I'm going to go ahead and exit out of my TNG or my CNC or my Vetric software. I'm going to exit out of my Vetric software. Uh, go ahead and exit out of this, and I'm going to go back in and reopen my Vetric software. And if I uh, create a new file, click OK. I should be able to go to my clip art tab into my custom folder. Where is my? Hmm. 
Now, V10, you didn't change to where I can't see my DXFs anymore, did you, buddy, bro? Stand by for a moment. I'm going to open up 9.5. Because I think they told us we needed to do it as a CRV instead of a DXF. But let me open up my 9.5 before I, before I correct myself. And then I'll get to you guys' question. Let me get, let me get past this one. All right, close that. I don't want to migrate nothing over. Create new file. Clip art. Hmm. Okay. So I'm going to change that away. I, I, normally on a DXF, I can import that in. You know, on a new file, I can always come in. Let's create the new file. I can always import the vector and navigate to my folder. And pull that in, you know, but I'd, I'd like to be able to see it in my clip art. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to resize this job right here, this blank job right here. I'm going to size it to uh, a two inch, not two inch wide, a 12 inch, six inch, six inch. Come on, Lane. Six by three, six by three. And I'm going to take this. This is a scalable graphic. So I'm not, I don't care, you know, what size it is and everything, but I'm going to hold down my shift key and size that down. Center it, F9, to center it on my board. And I'm going to save it, file save as, and I'm going to go into my custom folder here. It's a CRV file, and I'm going to call this my Flourish Border 1. And I should be able to see it there. And I'm in 10 now. I should be able to see it there. And I should be able to just drag and drop it in. And then, of course, it's a vector. So it's a scalable graphic. I can scale it to any size that I need. So I, my new uh, thing, instead of importing it in as a DXF, which I could export it out. That's, what, that's why I have a DXF folder, but you can't see it in here. So I will be... Um, saving them as a CRV uh, in my custom folder so I can just drag and drop, you know, those objects in and I'll be able to see them in here. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what, you know, it's one of the things we can do. So, so to answer your question, Mike, how and where do you save your flourish work? Well, uh, I would have my flourish work on its own little page. I, the reason why I do the six uh, by three or six by six, like for my square designs, is so I get my thumbnails. And I can go with bigger thumbnails, right? I can, you know, so I can see them. I can see what my flourish work is and stuff. Um, but uh, it just gives me a nice, even, you know, number, even size board. So I get nice spacing and stuff. It's not radical. But uh, I end up saving it right as a CRV, a venture 
CRV file right into my custom folder on the C drive program file or uh, users, public, public documents and in the Vetrick files clip art folder. Um, I have a custom folder and that's where I would save them so I can pull them in. All right. Uh, Baron says, hope you're enjoying the great white north. I'm loving every minute of it. Uh, and uh, it's been absolutely wonderful being up here. Uh, Ken. Ken got in late. Explain how to use a roundover bit 2050. That's a great, great question. How to use the roundover bit 2050. So uh, in order to answer that question, let me draw it out real quick. So uh, my the, eight, the 2050 uh, eighth inch roundover bit is three eighths of an inch wide. It is a quarter inch tall, well, a little bit more than a quarter, but anyway, uh, it's got an internal radius of an eighth of an inch. And when I drew that or draw that, I get this funky little design right here. If I go into node editing mode, and I cut the vector right in the center of this span right here and cut the vector right over here. And then I delete the top left corner of that. And over here, if I add a line to the side about a 16th of an inch, let me zoom in so I can get that 16.0625 space bar to finish. And if I take and cut right here, if I go into node editing mode and I cut this vector right here and I take and move that vector down relative to its position, if I move down negative 0.125 and hit apply, and I take these two vectors right here and I join them together with a straight line, and then select all of these vectors and kind of group them together as one open vector. That is the eighth inch profile for the 2050 white side router bit, eighth inch roundover. Now, I gotta add this tool to my tool database. So I have to have that, that right side of that profile drawn to scale. Then I'm gonna open up my tool database here. Now I already have the uh, 2050 eighth inch roundover um, right here, but we're gonna add it again, just so you know how to do it. Uh, in my Imperial tools, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and click on uh, roundover bits, the category, and I'm gonna add a new tool, and I'm gonna drop down and choose form tool. And when I do, it's gonna draw out my 20, 50, eighth inch roundover bit. Now, I'm gonna create some settings for it. For the settings on the pass depth, it's a quarter inch plunge from the bottom of the bit to the bottom of that round over there where we wanna cut, that's a quarter inch height. And so for me, my pass depth is gonna be 0.25. Step over. I want to step over a third of this bit. So it's an eighth inch, eighth inch, eighth inch for a total of three eighths of an inch, right? So I want to step over 33.3%, which is going to take me to 0.1249, close enough, instead of 125, 1249 is going to get me there. Uh, I'm going to run this bit around 24,000 RPMs. Uh, it's going to run at about 45 inches per minute and plunge about 15 inches per minute. I'm going to click. I'm not gonna click apply yet. I'm gonna change the name. I'm gonna edit the name. And on the name, I want the diameter and I want the units, you know, the three inch diameter and the units. And the tool type is a form tool, but I'm gonna get rid of the tool type here and I'm gonna type in uh, WS2050. RO round over, right? White side 2050 round over. And I'm gonna click OK. And I'm gonna apply that and add that to my tool library. Okay? Now, click 
Click OK. Now I want to use it. How do I use it? Uh, let's go ahead and open up and draw a rectangle. Uh, with no radius corners, square corners. All right, I'm going to do a profile toolpath. Profile toolpath. On that toolpath, I'm starting at zero, and my cut depth is going to be a quarter of an inch. Why is it a quarter of an inch? Because we want to round off the corners, uh, or, you know, we want a nice round off. And if I come back in here and put my profile back in there, and let's draw the rectangle around the profile. But if I come in here and I drew a, prof a rectangle like this, and I move that rectangle, snap it to there, I'm rounding off that corner, okay? So my pass depth from the bottom of my bit you know, from the top of my wood, I want to pass down a quarter of an inch, whoops, quarter of an inch to get that full round over. Okay. All right. Now, if I, I'm going to be using, let's select the right tool. We're going to go into our round over bits and choose our tool. And when we choose our tool to cut, we're going to choose, uh, we're going to cut on the outside of the bit cut on the outside of the vector, not the bit. And what that does is that has the right side of my bit cutting on the outside of my vector, which is this edge here. And I need it to be offset inward to round it over. So I need to go negative towards the line is negative, away from the line is positive. I don't care if you're on the inside of the vector or the outside of the vector. Towards the line is negative, away from the line is positive. I need to go negative an eighth of an inch because that is the distance from the right edge of the bit to the inside edge here. It is an eighth of an inch. So I need to offset it inward an eighth of an inch. And I need to calculate that toolpath. Not that, not the toolpath on the bit, sorry. On the rectangle there, calculate that toolpath. Let me open that back up. This guy, the rectangle, rectangle. Calculate the toolpath. Okay, what that's going to do is that's going to give me a little bit of a round over there, right? And if I were to profile cut that piece out, profile cut straight through 0.75 with my quarter inch in mill on the outside of the cut and calculate that, preview that selected toolpath. Get rid of our waste. That's what gives us that nice little eighth inch round over. Know what I mean? All right, so hopefully, Ken, that answers your question. Uh, let's see here. Um, David, great. Uh, absolutely, email me about that orientation and I'll let you know if I don't get it and everything. Um, and I do have your number on file. All right, let's see here. Carl, I have V6 and V8.0 and V9.5 icons on my laptop. Do I need the V6 and the V8? Can I remove them, the first two icons? Yes, you can go in to the your desktop and delete the icon. You don't need it visible there anymore. Unless you need to refer back to an original database or something, you can actually go through and uninstall that. Uh, but I wouldn't. Just delete the icon. You don't need the icons there anymore. And that was from Carl. He was asking, uh, he has he has V6, V8, 9.5 icons on his laptop. He's already updated to 9.5. Does he need to keep those icons on his, on his desktop? No. Just select the icon, right-click, and delete it. You don't need it on there anymore. All right, let's uh, let's wrap this up. Let's see here. Uh, Grant, you're welcome for the information. Uh, Jeff, thanks, Lenny. Great class. I like the ability to ask questions. Uh, see you in the next week. Uh, learn uh, things. 
I did not know how. Excellent. I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear that, Jeff. Uh, Jay Williams from Avery, North Carolina. Howdy. <laughs> and um, Rochelle's got a question. Do I start with a cut depth of 0.25 when I use the roundover bit? No. Start with a depth of zero and you cut down to 0.25 when you use the roundover bit. If, if it's a quarter inch roundover bit, you know, this particular roundover bit, uh, let's go in back into that profile that I drew. This particular roundover bit, uh, Rochelle, is if I measure from the bottom of the bit vertically, if I measure from the bottom of the bit to the bottom of the roundover, it's a quarter of an inch. So that's my cut depth. But I do not start do not start at a quarter of an inch or it's going to plunge that bit down to here and then it's going to cut down, you know, another quarter. So your start depth is zero. Your cut depth is 0.25 if you have a router bit that has the similar makeup and profile of that bit. Okay, basically from the bottom of your bit to the bottom of the roundover is going to be your cut depth. Unless you want a little bit of a, a lip uh around the rim then you can cut you know deeper so what i mean by that is if i did this round over with a cut depth of um 0.25 plus another oh 0.3125 another 30 second why does that number not look right to me 03125. Yeah, 30 second. Uh, equals, if I cut down to there, calculate. If we are to look, what that will give me is that straight edge of that bit that will give me a little bit of a lip. So when my round over cuts down, I'll get that little bit of a reveal there. And if I go deeper, 16th of an inch or an eighth of an inch, like if I added, you know, um, another 30 second for the full 16th. And calculated that toolpath, previewed that toolpath, then I'd have a 16th of an inch little rim around there. Have you ever seen, you know, like when you do your OG bits and stuff? So... Start depth of zero, otherwise you end up with this straight lip and everything if you want a nice transition from the top of your board to your round over. Okay, but we can cut deeper to get that, you know, that look if that's what we're going for. Okie dokie, okie dokie. All right, good question, Rochelle. Um, Ken Singleton says, I know it's late, but how would I round over the other edge? I'm assuming you're referring to the back side of the job, Ken, the back edge. How would you round over the back edge? Uh, that is a two-sided project. So in your job setup, you would do a two-sided project. And you would take that rectangle vector and you would copy it to the other side. And you would flip over to, you would toggle to the bottom side and you would create a profile toolpath, cutting an eighth of an inch deep or a quarter of an inch deep, got an eighth on my mind with that round over bit on the outside of the cut, stepping over negative 0.125, that step over we need, that allowance, we calculate that out, and we preview all sides. Let me change this real quick to maple, Canadian. So 
So we have our round over on the one side and our round over with the lip on the other because that one started out deeper, you know? So that's how you would round over the other edge. It's a two-sided project. Or take it over to your router table if you have one in your shop and run it on there. But it's a two-sided project. So Rochelle asked the question, do I, uh, Rochelle, for my end profile uh, after I do the round over? Yes, you, your profile cut to cut out all the way through, that is always the last file that you run. You're gonna do your round over first and then you're going to do your final profile cut to cut the part out. Absolutely. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do here is we're going to um, file close. We're going to go back into our welcome sign with texture here. And we're going to Finish up with the last thing that I said, which was on side two, the keyhole toolpath. Keyhole toolpath is very simple, guys and girls. If I'm gonna, if I have VCar Pro or Aspire, I'm gonna use the gadget. And I what I need to start with is a little circle, basically a circle where I want the keyhole to be. So my keyhole diameter is gonna be three-eighths of an inch, 0.375. So that's how big I'm gonna make that circle. I'm gonna click apply. And now I want a one inch keyhole in the center of my uh, board. And notice I'm on the bottom side here because look at the signs upside down when I flipped, you know? So I'm drawing down here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up my alignment tool and I'm gonna center this left and right on my board, that center. And then I'm gonna move it to the right relative to its position, I'm gonna move it over one inch, okay? And that's the position where I want my keyhole to be, okay? Uh, I'm good where it's at as far as the height of it and everything. So I'm gonna go into my gadgets here and I'm gonna to go to the keyhole gadget with that circle selected. <clears throat> and on my keyhole gadget, I'm going horizontal right to left, my circle's on the right-hand side. I wanna go right to left towards the center of my board. My depth of my slot is going, you know, the head of my little keyhole bit is a quarter of an inch uh, thick. So I wanna get, you know, uh, go that deep, uh, a little bit deeper. I could probably go about, you know, 0.3 or something. Uh, but I'm gonna go 0.25 and the length of my slot is gonna be one inch. My entry hole is 0.375. And my slot diameter is the diameter of the neck, the neck of my keyhole bit, which is 3 sixteenths of an inch. Give me decimal point, 0.1875. Now I have to set up a dummy end mill, dummy end mill, because we can't draw a keyhole bit and add it to our tool pass. We have to use an end mill so it can read the speeds and feeds. That's all it reads from the bit. So we use a dummy end mill. So I'm gonna select from my tool database, I do have a category that I've created called dummy bits. I have a dummy keyhole bit and a dummy dovetail bit, my three inch dovetail. So I'm gonna select on that and it's an end mill. And on my pass depth, I want it to do one pass. So it's gonna go 0.25. So we're gonna click apply to change that. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit select, adding that dummy end mill, and then I'm gonna click okay. It's gonna give me a keyhole toolpath right here to run. If we were to preview that, I'm not gonna be able to see the plunge hole, but um, 
I'm going to just see the slot of that dummy end mill. So I'm going to move my keyhole bit. It doesn't even look like a keyhole, but it is. This is just a slot of that dummy end mill picture. Now, for you ladies and gentlemen that do not have VCAR Pro or Aspire and you do not have access to the keyhole gadget, what you want to do is you want to draw a rectangle. And this rectangle that I draw is going to be one inch wide by 0 0.001 inches high, one thousandth of an inch high. Come over here and click. Okay, it looks like a line from this far away, but when we zoom in, it's a little bitty, bitty, bitty rectangle. I want to make sure that's centered on my board. So with it selected, I'm going to open my alignment tool and center it left to right. And I want to move it down a bit. Right about there. Okay. Now, to use the keyhole toolpath, you can go from the left to the right or the right to left. It depends on where you want the little screw hole, entry hole to be, you know. I'm going to go right to left. So I'm going to zoom in really tight on the right side of my rectangle. I'm going to go into node editing mode and I'm going to delete this span, this right line. Okay. And now I'm going to create a profile toolpath. Profile toolpath, cutting a quarter of an inch deep with my dummy end mill. on the line and we're going to calculate that tool path what that's going to do is that bit is going to come down and let's zoom in here and let's turn this a little bit let's come down here that bit is going to travel over and it's going to come down follow that vector path move over just a little bit that one thousandth of an inch and then come back out and back out the same hole that it came in and you that one thousandth of an inch is so small you won't even notice it okay so that's how you create its keyhole toolpath when you don't have access to the keyhole gadget all right all right okay okay so now I've got my keyhole toolpath. We only need one. So I'll delete that one. Got my keyhole toolpath on side two. I would save that file. File, um, save that toolpath. In my project folder. And this is gonna be Side two, keyhole toolpath, keyhole bit. Welcome with texture, side two. First file for side two, it's going to be the keyhole toolpath keyhole bit. Save that to the rest of my project folder and we're done. All right, so let's see here. Uh, Rochelle Stanton uh, finishing up. This is our last question for the night. Uh, for the edge, I would first do the round over but not cut through the board. After I complete the round over and finish cutting the board, do I begin 0.25 depth with my end mill, then complete the cut? All right, so what Rochelle's asking here is if she's done her cut depth or you know her profile toolpath, um, let's draw a rectangle on here. And let's create a profile toolpath with our round over bit, cutting 0.25 with our round over bit on the outside of the line, stepping over that negative 0.125. Let's go ahead and calculate that. 
and reset this preview and preview that selected toolpath. Let's get her cut out here. Okay. Rochelle saying, hey, if I've already done the round over to a cut depth of a quarter of an inch on my profile toolpath, do I begin at 0.25 deep with my end mill? No, Rochelle, you start at zero. The reason being is we've stepped this bit over an eighth of an inch. So the profile toolpath has to cut away this wood. That, that eighth of an inch little pocket there, or that quarter of an inch deep pocket right there is an eighth of an inch stepped over. So there's still a lot of wood out here. So we would create another profile toolpath starting at zero, cutting all the way through our material this time with our appropriate end mill, in my case, a quarter of an inch. And we calc on the outside of the line, we calculate that tool path. And when we preview that cut, watch this cut. You see how it's cutting out here, not where that groove is, because that round over bit was stepped over. So you start at zero. Okay, you start at zero for both of those bits. You do your round over first, zero to a quarter of an inch. Your profile cut last, zero to whatever it is to cut through your board. Now, when I say on your round over a quarter of an inch, that is based on this white side 2050 round over bit that has from the bottom of that bit to the bottom of the round over is a quarter of an inch. You would measure your round over bit to find out what your cut depth is going to be. All right. Awesome. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, those are all great questions. I really appreciate everything uh, that uh, you guys uh, hanging out and sticking in with me and everything. Hopefully it was a good class. We, I tried to make it a two and a half hour class, but we ended up going, we're about 2.52, two hours, 52 minutes. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, learned a few things here or there. Um, and um, yeah, let's uh, reset this uh, preview for myself. Let's flip back over to side one here and let's preview all the tool paths on side one. I'm going to end with our last picture to look at what we created tonight. Preview all the tool paths on side one. And uh, next week, next week, uh, Tuesday, we should have a class unless I'm on the road. I'm going to be in Canada, Hamilton this week. It all depends on when I get back and stuff, but I will, uh, you'll see me live next week, next Tuesday for our next class. If in fact I'm back in town, I should be back in town from Canada by then, but uh, you never know. You never know. So let me uh, let that finish up and let's uh, zoom in here and take a look at our little, uh, Welcome sign. Let me get that. I like a Canadian maple look for a nice white look. Let's close that tool and pop over here. Zoom that up. And all in all, not a bad looking sign for messing around and doing some Q&A tonight. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, I'll see you soon.